Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Brian Fishman, Director of Counterterrorism and Dangerous Organizations at Facebook, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for this program with former U.S. National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster. This program is part of the club's Good Lit series, underwritten by the, underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. We thank our audience for your support of the Commonwealth Club. If you wish to make a donation, please text the word DONATE to 415-329-4231. We also want to remind you to submit questions for General McMaster via the chat room next to your screen, and I'll get to as many as possible later in the program. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, former National Security Advisor under President Trump, senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, and author of the new book, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. General McMaster is one of the most celebrated modern military leaders in America. He spent 34 years in the U.S. Army, including as a captain during the Gulf War and fighting the insurgency during the war in Iraq. He then served for 13 months in the Trump White House. In his new book, Battlegrounds, General McMaster argues that American foreign policy has been misconceived, inconsistent, and poorly implemented since the end of the Cold War. He describes efforts to reassess and fundamentally shift policies while he was National Security Advisor, and he provides a pathway forward designed to improve strategic competence and complex competitions against our adversaries. Welcome, General McMaster. Hey, Brian, great to see you again. Thanks for your service to our country over so many years, and, and it's great to reconnect with you here in Silicon Valley. Yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure. Um, so your, your book makes, if I could characterize it, two basic claims. I think the, the first one, as, as you know, you've been getting a lot of questions about this, is in that preface, that you didn't want this to book to be political, you didn't want it to be a tell-all. And then the bulk of the, the book is, is focused on how you envision American strategy with reference to your time as National Security Advisor and your, and your time in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think there you're making the argument that our strategy has been unclear, we need to have more clarity and goals, and we need to have a forceful American presence in the world. Is, is that sort of, is that a fair characterization? I think so, Brian, and, and you were with me in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and what really frustrated me in many of these missions in, in our, the wars of the 21st century for the United States is the disconnect, the disconnect between reality on the ground in those places mm -hmm. and plans that, and, and policies and strategies that I think were based more on, on fantasy in, in Washington. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell the story in the book about my conversation with our friend Joel Rayburn at one point mm -hmm. when we were frustrated by this disconnect in Iraq in particular. And, and he mm -hmm. made the quip of, well, you know, we're in Iraq, but it seems like our strategy is based on my rack. And my mm -hmm. rack is whatever people in Washington really would like it to be. And so, mm -hmm. so I, I describe this in, in the book as 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 a phenomenon <laughs> uh, uh, that I that I call strategic narcissism: the tendency to mm -hmm. define the world only in relation to us uh, and, and how we would like it to be, and therefore to neglect the agency, the influence, the authorship over the future that others, including our our rivals, our adversaries, and our enemies, have uh, over the over the future course of events. You, you famously, before you wrote Battlegrounds, wrote Dereliction of Duty, uh, a sort of an assessment of civil military relations and goal setting in and around Vietnam. Do you think that we have made the same kind of mistakes in Iraq and Afghanistan? I mean, and and I guess if we have, why, why haven't we gotten better at this? Yeah. You know, we've, we've studied Vietnam and those failures ad nauseum. Right. Well, the... the uh... My analysis of this in the book is that is a really after the end of the Cold War, we began to, re to, to, to lose our strategic competence. And remember, the, of course, the Cold War uh, was followed rapidly. The, you know, the, the, the uh, lifting of travel restriction between East Germany and West Germany precipitated the really the, the end of East Germany, the, the, the continued stress on the Soviet Union, its ultimate collapse. And of course, that was a reason for optimism, right? If, as you recall, President George H.W. Bush said that he hoped now that that, that the rule of law would, would govern the intercourse between nations um, rather than the rule of the of the jungle. Of course, that was followed quite rapidly by a hot war uh, in in in, uh, in in the Persian Gulf mm -hmm. and and a lopsided victory over the fourth largest army in the world, Saddam Hussein's Saddam Hussein's army. 
And I think that bolstered our confidence even further. And through the 1990s, we based our foreign policy on three fundamental assumptions that turned out to be over-optimistic. And that first of these is that there's an arc of history that guaranteed the primacy of our free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems. A corollary to that, especially in connection with the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and China had not experienced this, you know, this orders of magnitude uh, growth uh, in, in its economy and the strengthening of its armed forces. And so we, we, we thought, thought you know, uh, great power competition is a relic of the past. Instead, that competition will be replaced by you know, global governance and a condominium of, 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 of nations who would work together on the world's greatest problems. And the third, uh, the third assumption was that the technological military prowess that we demonstrated in the Gulf War meant that, mm-hmm. that if any country, if any adversary even had the temerity to challenge the United States, a future mm-hmm. conflict would be fast, cheap, efficient, and, and relatively low cost. And, and, and these assumptions, I think, Brian, were a setup. They were a setup for, for the strategic shock of the mass murder attacks of 9-11 when al-Qaeda avoided our tremendous military advantages and, and adopted an asymmetric approach to, to, to mass murder uh, mm-hmm. using box cutters and airplanes. And then the unanticipated length and difficulty of the wars in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I argue in the book that the cost and length of those wars, w- w- those wars were lengthened and they were more costly because we took a short-term approach mm-hmm. to, to really what should have been long-term endeavors to consolidate military gains and get to, in both places, a sustainable political outcome consistent with our interests. And then, mm-hmm. and then of course, you know, we have an, other shocks like the financial crisis Right. And, and, and that pendulum swung in, in terms of the emotional impetus behind our foreign policy from over-optimism, you know, maybe hubris in the 90s, to pessimism and really resignation uh, in, in the 2000s. And, and so the book is largely an argument, well, how about something in between those two? How about really trying to understand these problem sets on their own terms and overcoming strategic narcissism, which is the assumption mm-hmm. that either what we do or what we decide not to do is decisive to the outcome uh, and, and applies strategic empathy to view these complex challenges we and other uh, other free nations face today from the perspective of the other and to come and to try to understand these 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 uh, challenges on their own terms. Mm-hmm. How does that I mean, how does that apply in these conflicts, you know, running from Syria now to Afghanistan or, or even Western Pakistan, some would define it as right is you the what should our goal be right and 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 i think one of the things that that there was a hallmark of your your tenure in, as a national security advisor was the 2017 national security strategy and sort of trying to lay out ends ways means in that sense but i think one of the things that that still frustrates me and frustrates other analysts that are that look at these problems is is not knowing exactly what we're trying to accomplish in these places and 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 I don't know how we we fix that problem. I mean, it, it requires real political leadership, um, you know. Which is the which is you know we'll come back to this. But is is there a tension there in your book between not wanting to talk about politics when politicians are setting those goals? Not not really at all. And as you, yeah. as you know, have seen the book. I mean, I'm very yeah. critical of multiple administrations, including the yeah. Trump administration. Yeah. And on your question of goals, I mean, it's really important to have a goal. It's really yeah. important to have objectives because otherwise you're like Alice in Wonderland, any path will get you there. <laughs> so yeah. so I, I think it, it is a disservice to our nation. It's a disservice certainly to the servicemen and women mm-hmm. who are fighting in these wars if they don't understand really not only what are the goals and objectives, but what is the strategy that aims to achieve those goals and objectives at an acceptable mm-hmm. cost and risk. And so I, in the in the conclusion of the of the book, uh, Battlegrounds, I I, I, I I hearken back to the book I wrote on Vietnam. And, and I, I discussed the lessons I brought with me into that job. It was kind of a surreal feeling, you know, walking into McGeorge Bundy's office, really, right. in the West Wing and having criticized national security decision making and, and policy making during the Vietnam War to, to, to sort of, of course, have it dawn on me. Well, now I'm in charge of that process. And, right. and so what we did, Brian, I described this in the, in the book is we put in, in place a, a different step, right, a different step in formulating policy and strategy. Typically, as you know, in Washington, you know, I mean, at least oftentimes, these policy strategies are generated bottom up kind of from the bureaucracy, right? From these mm-hmm. working groups that are convened yep. around what's called the Policy Coordinating Committee. 
And, and it's sort of like the equivalent of, oh, you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, discuss. Right? And, then, and then you have this bottom up process during which all types of satisficing behavior and lowest common denominator uh, compromises happen. Mm-hmm. And you get what, what I would call policy pablum. And so mm-hmm. what we tried to do instead is to focus a, a framing session, a framing session on a five page hard hitting paper that described the challenge that we're facing on its own terms, to view that challenge through the lens of our vital interests and to mm-hmm. an establish an, an overarching goal and more specific objectives. But then crucially, I think, to make some assumptions, to make mm-hmm. assumptions that typically in a planning process are implicit and oftentimes flawed, to make these assumptions explicit and test them and have conversation mm-hmm. about, about them, and especially assumptions involving the degree to which we have ownership, influence, control, you know, agency, we being the United States and like-minded partners over this mm-hmm. challenge. And then, and, and, uh, and I think that process worked. You know, I think we put in some play, into place some pretty significant shifts in U.S. policies, shifts that were long overdue. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and that, that framing session allowed then the principles around the table to get some top-down guidance to that policy coordinating committee. Once we had that discussion, I would bring it to the president and say, you know, I, uh, here's here's how we framed it. Do you agree with these objectives? Put out a cabinet memo and start on it. Now, you know, none of these strategies were perfect. Uh, all of them, of course, like all strategies, were imperfectly implemented. Yeah. And sadly, you know, as I tell the story of the of the the South Asia strategy, for example, uh, as well as, as strategies that are relevant to the really the humanitarian and political catastrophe in the greater Middle East, um, these were abandoned, I believe, prematurely. I think for uh, in, in both those cases, we had in place the for, for the first time a sustainable long-term approach to this long-term problem set. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and of course, uh, now what we have is, I think, a, a, a really bias in favor of disengagement as mm-hmm. an unmitigated good uh, fr- from, uh, from these complex competitions. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, I think this is where the, the sort of rubber hits the road on this notion of, um, you know, going from that strategic hubris to that disillusionment. I mean, because I think you're right. I mean, a lot of Americans across the political spectrum are are frustrated about, you know, the war, the war, the way the war in Iraq and the wars in Afghanistan have gone and dragged out. You know, how do you make the case that, that we should continue these? I think there was there were clear goals in mind yeah. when we did put these strategies in place. I, as yeah. I mentioned, they're long overdue, but they came in the 17th year of the war, right? Yeah, right. And, um, and you know what, what I often say about about the the war in Afghanistan, it's not a 19 year old a 19 year, year war. It's a yeah. it's a one year war, you know, 19 yeah. times over, right? And yep. and uh, and and so I don't, I don't blame the American people for losing confidence in the effort for you know the so called war weariness and so forth. I, I blame our, our leaders for not explaining to the American people really the two, the two, the, the, you know, the two fundamental things that the American people need to know. First of all, it's what is at stake? What's in it for us? Why do we care? And I think to answer mm-hmm. your question on what the goal is, the goal is to ensure that jihadist terrorist organizations never again have the capability, the, the, the capacity to commit mass murder uh, uh, you know, on U.S. soil or against U.S. interests abroad the way that they did on September 11th. Killing nearly three, you know three thousand innocents and taking trillions of dollars out of our, our economy, and the only way to I think to do that is to be engaged with those who we are enabling to take the brunt of that fight. So mm-hmm. in Afghanistan, for example, that means that requires hardening the Afghan state and its security forces against the regenerative capacity of the Taliban, who, by the way, are <laughs> are, are not separate from these other terrorist groups in this terrorist mm-hmm. ecosystem uh, that, that, that exists uh, between Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. And so, whereas it, it is, it, it, it requires sacrifice. We've had 10 courageous U S servicemen killed in action uh, in Afghanistan this year, but it's worth noting that 30 Afghan soldiers and police die every day yeah. fighting to preserve the freedoms that they, that we help them win uh, by kicking the Taliban out, out of power uh, in November, December of, of, of 2000 and 2001. And so I, I think it's, it's important for us to explain that to the American people, but our leaders aren't doing it, Brian, right? So, yeah. so we tend to, to look at the lack of popular support for these efforts overseas as immutable. Well, actually, if leaders were leading, 
and explaining what's at stake and explaining what the strategy is, I think Americans are willing to sacrifice. I know, you know, our, you know, our, our uh, former colleagues in the armed forces are, yeah. um, if, if they understand how those sacrifices are contributing to a worthy outcome. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, that, how do you assess the threat today? Because there has been con- conflicting reports over the last even several weeks about the, the strength of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, the strength of, of, you know, the ability of the Islamic State to, to regenerate. How do you assess the strength of these organizations today relative to the, you know, the last you know, well, 20 well, Brian, years in Al Qaeda? Brian, Brian I'll, ask, I'll ask you the same question. I'll give you my perspective. I'd love to hear yeah. what you think about it because you're monitoring all different sources of information, you know, uh, okay. by skimming social media and understanding the activity of terrorist organizations in, in that in that space. I think that that jihadist terrorist organizations are more dangerous today than they were on September 10th, 2001. Mm-hmm. And I think the reasons for that are threefold. The first is that they are orders of magnitude larger yeah. than the Mujahideen era alumni who committed the mass murder attacks of 9-11. Yeah. Now we have Al-Qaeda alumni. We have ISIS alumni. And by the way, these alumni are much more mobile. Uh, they've moved pretty heavily into Europe, into countries uh, that, that, that don't have re- visa requirements for travel to the to North America, for example. And then, and then uh, the second reason is that these groups now have access to much more destructive capabilities. Jihadist terrorists are working very, very hard to gain the destructive power previously associated only with nation states. Those include you know, bioweapons, as we can see, that would could be pretty scary and, yeah. and potentially effective against us. Uh, chemical weapons, uh, obviously, but but you know, dirty bombs. I think there, we ought to be maybe even surprised that there hasn't one one that hasn't already gone off in a city somewhere. Um, and, and then, of course, going after the most destructive weapons on Earth uh, as well, which is one of the reasons why Pakistan is a scary place, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that they have access to more destructive uh, capabilities. This is what some people have called the democratization of destruction. Uh, and and then and then thirdly, you know, these uh, the, these groups could gain in strength because we are appear to be so determined uh, really across the political spectrum to disengage right and 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 I think we will undervalue the importance of the work that we're doing every day to develop a better intelligence picture and to to, to keep the pressure on to to attack these organizations uh, that uh, that would otherwise do us harm now the, uh, the of course this is this is a, a short-term insurance policy. Mm-hmm. You, to get back to the question you asked earlier, okay, what does winning look like? And what's the objective? Yeah. The objective is to defeat these organizations. And that's going to require a longer term effort. That's going to require not only cutting them off from sources of physical and financial support, but also sources of ideological support. The long term battleground in this war, I believe, Brian, is education. Mm-hmm. Because when I look at, when I look at these, at the, these, uh, these enemies of all humanity, uh, what they do is they use ignorance to foment hatred and hatred to justify violence against innocence. And, uh, and so what, what's, re- what's required is to break that cycle of, of violence uh, and help bring people together. And part of these solutions are local. Part of them are, is regional. I think these Abraham Accords, actually, that is a really, really important development to recognize. I mean, I love the name of it. Right? We are all people of the book. Those who try to, 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 to cloak uh, their criminal agendas and and and, and their, their their criminal acts under the the false mantle of religion. I think this is going to make it harder for them. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, Saudi Arabia's at least you know at least explicit commitment and, and I hope heartfelt and genuine commitment to combat the Salafist jihadist ideology that lays mm-hmm. the foundation for for recruiting for these terrorist organizations and the brainwashing of of young vulnerable people. Uh, such that they are dehumanized and then and then weaponized against their fellow human beings. Um, so I, I I I think that we have a long term uh, effort that we have to continue to to focus on and improve. But in the short term, our our military efforts not with us necessarily directly going against these organizations, but enabling those who really have the most at risk in places like mm-hmm. in Af- Afghanistan uh, and uh, and in Syria and Iraq. I think that's a sound approach in the Sahel, for example, as part of a multinational effort in Somalia, as you know, the ongoing operations there. 
it sounds like a lot, right? It sounds like, wow, do we really want to keep stick with this? Well, you know, it's hard, it's hard to prove a negative, but I, I but I, I, I am confident. I, in fact, I think I know that we have prevented devastating attacks uh, mm-hmm. ba- based on the, the operations and efforts we've conducted since 9-11. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the, um, well, I, I, two questions. One is, I mean, I think that where, where folks come from is they say, well, look, if we've been engaged in these fights and, and where, they're, where, where the, the critique that I hear is people say, well, we've been engaged in these fights and yet the problem is worse. So is that the right approach? And, and the, <laughs> the sort of second one is how do we balance this containment of these, of these threats and the effort required there within this larger geopolitical frame, I'm pivoting a little bit to this larger geopolitical frame that you speak about with Russia sure. and China yeah. and make sure that the investments we're making there don't keep us from acknowledging and understanding and, right. and dealing with those larger issues. Well, I would say that the, the problem gets worse when we do disengage. So it, it, I tell the story of, of uh, the Obama administration really anxious to disengage, uh, yeah. both from Iraq and Afghanistan, an administration yeah. that and listen, look, I'm a nonpartisan guy. I'm just trying to look at this from a, a, a historical perspective. It was an administration, I think it's fair to say, that that defined its foreign policy mainly based on the president's opposition to the Iraq war, right? And, yeah. and you know, he initially called Afghanistan the good war. But in 2009, after a very lengthy review of the Afghan strategy, painful review because we're all waiting, okay, what are we going to do in this war? Um this the strategy comes out that is based on fantasy. I mean, it's it's a, it was an exercise in self delusion, and and this was this this idea that there's a bold line between the Taliban and these other jihadist terrorist groups that Al Qaeda, to quote President Obama, is a shadow of its former self, and that therefore uh, we can we can begin to disengage. And what's really most important is Al Qaeda in Pakistan, and therefore we will have a very close relationship with the Pakistanis and work on Al Qaeda there. Well. There were so many flaws in that in that argument. First of all, there was no bold line between the Taliban and, and Afghanistan. Al Qaeda wasn't a shadow of its former self. You recall in 2015, we had that large operation, Shorebuck Farms in Kandahar. Yeah. You know, a massive, the largest ever detected Al Qaeda training facility, guarded, run, administered by the Taliban. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the whole thing was a fantasy. The Pakistanis were not going to change their behavior. The ISI is driven mainly by its fear of India, uh, and its use of these terrorist organizations as an arm of its foreign policy since 1948. And so mm-hmm. it was it was an unsound policy. What's striking in the, in the story that I tell in Battlegrounds is the Trump administration has replicated that almost precisely, a- almost mm-hmm. all of those flaws. And, and it was really after that, Brian, it was, at, it was during that period of disengagement where the problem really became s- severe. Uh, it was mm-hmm. severe before that, but, but, but in, in, Af- in Afghanistan. Because in that 2009 speech, President Obama says, okay, we're going to reinforce the effort, but he announces the withdrawal timeline at the same time. So mm-hmm. if war really is a contest of wills and you're the Taliban, what do you do? You know, you just you just wait it out, right? Mm-hmm. And and so I would say that that's very similar as well to December 2011. Uh, Vice President Biden calls up President Obama and says, thank you for allowing me to end this goddamn war, right? What mm-hmm. happens after that? Prime Minister Maliki, who is no longer really countered by U.S. diplomatic as well as military influence, adopts these sectarian policies. There's a return of large-scale sectarian violence. ISIS doesn't come out of nowhere, right? ISIS comes out of the prisoner releases combined with the Sunni community feeling beleaguered and thinking the only way that they can protect themselves is through violence. And so ISIS becomes a patron and a protector. And they're welcomed in by at least portions of the population. That's really what happens. And so then you have by 2014, you know, the, the most brutal terrorist group in history, the most murderous terrorist group in history, creating the biggest refugee crisis since the end of World War II and in control of territory the size of Britain. Well, yeah. the war wasn't over. Think about Libya, right? In, in, in Libya, in the Obama administration's effort to, 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 uh, to, to not replicate what they viewed as the mistakes of the Bush administration, they actually exceeded them mm-hmm. by doing nothing to shape the, the, the political outcome in the wake of Gaddafi's collapse, much like the Bush administration mm-hmm. under value, under underappreciated, uh, undervalued the importance of consolidating gains politically in the wake of Saddam Hussein's uh, you know, uh, 
the collapse of his government, the Baptist government. So I could go on about this, but he, what I'm concerned about is we haven't learned the lesson, right? And mm-hmm. in fact, our our, our our attribution of our uh, uh, to the cause that we attribute uh, to our our you know our frustration there is exactly mm-hmm. kind of in many ways the opposite of the true cause, which is the short term mentality applied to a long term problem. Mm-hmm. So how do you? Yeah, I think it's well. Let me divert. I want to come back to this issue of how do we balance the, this effort with this lar- with our larger sort of strategy towards you know geopolitical adversaries, Russia, China, etc. But well, let, let me just think- let me just qualify this quickly, sure. though, Brian. I just want to say yeah. I'm not arguing for hundreds of thousands of troops, right? I yeah. mean, when, when President Trump said, "Hey, we're getting out of Syria," right? Yeah, he was talking about 300 soldiers, 300 right. soldiers, right? Uh, and and uh, and and of course, the, whatever, whether it's eleven thousand five hundred or eight thousand five hundred or five hundred in Afghanistan, all we do is talk about these numbers. It th- that doesn't matter. That that's minuscule compared to yeah. the deployment of troops. You know, for example, on the Korean Peninsula since you know since nineteen fifty three, for example. Mm-hmm. And, and so it is a sustainable commitment, I, I, I believe. Yeah. And we tend we we're talking ourselves ourselves out of it. We're talking ourselves into war weariness and into. Mm-hmm a precipitous withdrawal that we're going to pay for later. I believe we're going to pay for it later, right? Yeah. I mean, if if the Al-Qaeda in Iraq really sees out of prison, form the backbone, as you know, because you tracked all this, of ISIS, and, you're, and you've written about it, uh, how about these these Taliban that we just released in, in Afghanistan? What, what are they going to do? And, and mm-hmm. so I, I think that, that we're going to reap the whirlwind on this one. Yeah. Is it your view that that i mean you know I, I you you're you're clearly concerned about the 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 sort of tendency of the obama administration and the trump administration and some level to to pull out of of uh or, or reduce our commitment in in syria iraq afghanistan there also seems to be a sort of an instinct to withdraw from from europe um a conflict with nato allies um we we didn't do the the TPP in uh, in Asia. Um, how does this sort of instinct to withdraw manifest within the Trump administration? Because it seems like it's a different. You know, we may get to a similar outcome, but it seems like it's a different instinct than what motivated the Obama administration. Or maybe that maybe that's wrong. I, I'm I'm not sure. Well, there, there's a, there's a point at which, <laughs> you know, uh, conservative kind of isolationism meets democratic, you know, liberal retrenchment. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I, I write about this in the, in the conclusion of Battlegrounds. What is really the intellectual impetus behind uh, the, this, this, uh, the, this movement to disengage or the argument for disengagement? And, uh, and I think it's a combination on, on, the, you know, on the left, maybe you could say, of, of really kind of the, the dominance of the new left interpretation of history in mm-hmm. which, and I'm, for, I'm oversimplifying here and I don't mean to offend anybody, but yeah, I mean, I, it's essentially that all the ills of the world prior to 1945 are due to colonialism. All of the ills of the world after 1945 are due to communist or capitalist imperialism, and, and, and therefore uh, we are the problem. And if we disengage from these complex areas, the situation will get better. Right mm-hmm. now, now that is almost the same argument, right? Uh, on on the on the right uh, as well, you know. And this would be, you know, this would be the or the so-called realist school, right? Who mm-hmm. who argue that that the U.S. Uh, efforts overseas have been in pursuit of liberal hegemony, right? This is a straw man. That they set up, and this realist school is actually an ideological school mm-hmm. uh, because they see our disengagement from every problem as, as an unmitigated good. Because again, we are the problem, and uh, and and so I, it's not a partisan problem. I think it cuts across both political parties, and this is why you have you know you have uh, you you have uh, unusual bedfellows, strange mm-hmm. bedfellows of, of of George Soros and 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 Charles Koch, right mm-hmm. funding. Uh, some of these kind of uh, pseudo think tanks that are popping up that are making th- this ar- this argument for disengagement as a, as an unmitigated good. Mm-hmm. In in your experience, I mean, you you helped lay out these strategies, and you and yet it you know you you reflect in the book that President Trump didn't always follow through on these um, on some of the, the the this guidance. What's motivating President Trump in these in these engagements, you know, in Europe with potential allies on the, in the Pacific Rim and South Asia, um, 
around some of these larger, you know, geopolitical adversaries that you identify Russia and China? Yeah, well, you know, there, there's the conventional wisdom, you know, because the president's language is often offensive to allies, right, and, and creates yeah. strains and alliances at the at the public level. The conventional wisdom is that there's, you know, there's very little coordination or international effort ongoing to mm-hmm. confront either Russian uh, aggression in the form of cyber-enabled information operations, really the, a sustained campaign of political subversion against Europe and the United States, uh, and against his own opposition figures, yeah. you know, as well, well as we see as the poisoning of of Navalny, um, and and, uh, and and with China, that there's a lack of international cooperation there. Actually, that's not true. I don't think. In reality, mm-hmm. there's a very high degree of international cooperation hmm. on both problem sets. Now, both problem problem sets are different. The the problem and challenge associated with the Chinese Communist Party and its aggressive actions is much different from, from the, the problem associated with, uh, with Putin and, and Russia. Uh, you know, Ch- China has, has real power, economic power, military power uh, that, that, can, that can rival the United States and, and, and help them pursue this goal, I think, of, of establishing exclusionary areas of primacy across the Indo-Pacific and then, mm-hmm. and then challenging the U.S. globally, both from an economic as well as from a security uh, standpoint. Whereas Russia just doesn't have those those resources available, and and therefore rather than than you know than than collapsing the existing order and replacing it with a new one more favorable to Chinese interests, on so in the case of the the the, the Chinese Communist Party, Russia is just trying to drag everybody else down. Right. So mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. they can't be stronger themselves, they're going to drag everybody else down. So essentially, Vladimir Putin is is the figure to, you know the the last man standing right in mm-hmm. in Europe. And, and there is a high degree of, of international cooperation, I think, ongoing now, especially especially after the recent sort of aggressive actions by China. So if I can just go to let me just go to China. I know I know probably yeah. a lot of so a lot of people's minds, but I think there are three elements of what, what I describe in the book is I try to describe what are the emotions, the aspirations and the ideology that drive and constrain Chinese Communist Party leaders. This is an effort to really get a strategic empathy as uh, you know, as a cure you know, for strategic narcissism, right? And mm-hmm. and uh, and 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 what I I think today, at least, just to to bring it up to what you see in the news and what people are talking about today, there are three misunderstandings about the nature of the competition with China. The first of these is that you know this is really just a U.S. China problem, you know, because you know the mm-hmm. Trump administration is so mean, right? Mm-hmm. That Xi Jinping has to you know, has to respond. Well, I mean. Actually, I don't see that as the case at all. I think mm-hmm. the onus on, on, in terms of the and the blame for the duration, uh, you know, in the relationship is is on the Chinese Communist Party, and mm-hmm. has everything to do with the shift in in first Hu Jintao's uh, leadership, but then especially Xi Jinping, and and it's based really on the on the party's desire, right, the desire to to extend and tighten its exclusive grip on power internally, and to export its export uh, export its. Uh, you know, it's it's a statist, uh, authoritarian, mercantilist model. You know, ex- externally, and how can it be a U.S. you know China problem? If you know, if, if it is China that you know that if you know the, the repression of the news of human to human transmission for COVID nineteen, the the subversion of the World Health Organization, the wolf warrior diplomacy aimed you know at Europe and the United States to add an insult yep. to injury, you know the, the the cyber espionage campaign against our medical research facilities and hospitals in the middle of a pandemic, you know the massive cyber attacks which I'm sure you're tracking on in, in Australia, but but really globally, you know the the bludgeoning to death of of, uh, of Indian soldiers on the Himalayan frontier, uh, the, you know the acceleration of the you know the greatest land grab so to speak in history in the South China Sea, the threats to Taiwan. Mm-hmm. Okay, I could go on, right? Mm-hmm. That cultural genocide campaign in Xinjiang is mm-hmm. that that's probably not Donald Trump's fault. I don't think that's the U.S.'s fault. Mm-hmm. And so what we have, I believe, is a free world China Chinese Communist Party problem. Uh, and, and what's extremely important is for us to convince the, the leadership that they can have enough without pursuing these aggressive policies that that undercut you know our our interests and, and our security and, and our prosperity. The the second myth is you know is this lack of international cooperation. There's a very high degree of international cooperation on, for example, cyber, which I'm sure you tracked in mm-hmm. December 2018. Brian, that was unprecedented. Those indictments and sanctions against APT10, you know, the main yep. Chinese hacking uh, organization. I think it was 12, was 12, 14 countries, you know, simultaneously. We're working extremely well with Japan right now. And it's mm-hmm. sad to see President Abe go. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that may have been the closest relationship we've ever had, you know, with Japan. Um, and, and the quad is kind of coming together, which is this format of Australia, India, Japan, and the U.S. And 
Mm -hmm. you know, and he had been kind of a reluctant partner there until they they really had to come face to face with with the party's increasing uh, aggression aggression and, and hostility, Chinese Communist Party's hostility, and and um, and so I could go I could go on about that. So that's that's right. the, the the second myth, and the third is that there's this Thucydides trap, right? That mm -hmm. a, a, the only choice we have, Brian, with China is either to lie supine, <laughs> to be passive, mm -hmm. and, 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 and accommodate uh, their, their aggression, uh, or to go toward confrontation. And what I believe was happening, because we weren't actively competing, is we were on a path to, comp to, to confrontation before. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I mean, I, I'm sure there'll be more questions about this, but I think... Yep. But historians will look back at the Trump administration with all its flaws and say that they enacted a bipartisan shift in U.S. foreign policy on China that was the most significant shift in foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. Wow. So I, I'm, I'm looking at some of our, our audience questions now, and I'm going to try to you've, – you've, you've addressed some of them. But um, let's ask this question about, about you know – Dealing with cyber terrorism, dealing with cyber threats. Do you think that we have a solid whole of government, whole of society approach to these kinds of threats, which manifest in a variety of different ways? I mean, that that, that phrase is almost too large and flexible. Everything from you know terrorists operating on the internet to um, to to true cyber disruptive activities by by nation states. Do you feel like we've got a handle on this? Yeah. Right. Now. So, so, yeah. So, Brian, how about if I take a short answer attack at this and maybe you add your perspective from where you right. are? I think the way that the question is crafted is, is immensely important because it isn't just a government approach. It's a, it has to be it does have to be a whole society approach. And I think what we've seen with various cyber threats from jihadist terrorist organizations, for example, who are becoming more capable to the most high end capable powers, which are China and Russia, uh, is that is that each of them pose slightly different threats. I think with China. The principal threat seems to be cyber-enabled industrial espionage uh, mm -hmm. with Russia. Uh, it is cyber-enabled information warfare as well as threats to direct threats to infrastructure. Uh, with North Korea, uh, they're probably the best at cyber crime. And, and, and Iran is also trying to perfect its ability to go after infrastructure, whether it's financial uh, infrastructure as they attacked us, what, 2007, I think it was, mm -hmm. Brian, uh, or, uh, or the attacks that they demonstrated on Aramco. Uh, these, I, I think, I think the, the threats, are, you know, we have to, cyber threats are in various categories, mm -hmm. different adversaries, rivals, enemies, you, you know, have, have different competitive strengths and uh, relative strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so what we need, you know, what we need is, is, is really what, what, uh, some have called, you know, a, a uh, you know, an active layered defense, certainly. Mm -hmm. And I think what we recognized, uh, you know, in this, in the administration, when I joined it and I, I'm happy that that I was able to, to help you know, get in place changes in policy that that recognize that you can't have a, a good defense in cyberspace without a good offense and I write about this in battlegrounds and I speculate Brian and this is this is not that I advocate for it uh, that, that that the private sector is going to have to also really begin to develop more and more kind of cyber reconnaissance uh, and offensive capabilities potentially you know as well because as you know, with the large surface areas we're trying to defend in cyberspace, there's no way to be exclusively defensive uh, and, and, to, and to survive really a sustained attack o o over time. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other aspect of this fight is, I mean, it's never going to be over, right? It will never be over. As you know, yeah. you know, every time you develop a countermeasure, your adversaries are trying to get around it. So it's going to be this continuous interaction, this continuous intense competition. But what I try to emphasize in the, in the, in the book is the need for us to protect our infrastructure and protect our national security innovation base. And mm -hmm. it has to be a public and, and private sector effort. It must be. Mm -hmm. And we have to design systems that degrade gracefully rather than fail catastrophically. And, uh, and, and, and so I, I think there's a defensive aspect to this. There's an offensive aspect to this, but what's I think concerning me on the horizon, Brian, is that it is possible to deter, not just through, counteractions in cyberspace, but the broad range of other actions that are available from law enforcement to, right. I mean, military efforts, potentially, uh, a state-based adversary, because you can hold something of value to that state at risk, right? Now, these non-state actors, I mean, they might think, yeah, I've got nothing to lose, right? And 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 so, the, so it's very difficult to deter, I think, cyber actors 
uh, who are part of of transnational organizations, you know, non-state yeah. cyber uh, actors. So, Brian, I, what, what's your assessment of of where we are on, on cyber and and the threats and and what we're doing to counter them? Yeah. Well, I think it depends on how you think about the the threat. I mean, based on my sort of historical experience, I, I you know, when I was teaching at West Point 15 years ago, we were uh, tracking uh, the way that terrorist organizations were using the internet, and that was before the rise of social media and 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 the sort of the way that that conversation happens today. Um, and so that's one that's one sort of aspect of it. And and I do think that oftentimes we um, we bias towards the recent and think that everything is new when in fact many of these dynamics are older and reflect you know um, historical trends. I'm thinking of Thomas Thomas Ridd's book Active Measures about yeah, some of these kinds of one. dynamics. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that has been asked here is, are you concerned that that Russia, China, I mean, we, you've been very clear about the efforts of the Russians in the 2016 election to impact that election. Are you concerned that these sort of state actors will have a, a real impact on our election that's, you know, ongoing right now? I mean, we are in prime election season. Right. You know, you know Brian, we, we, we stood up, a, as you know, new organizations. Uh, one of which is, you know, is headquartered kind of at the, at the Department of, at the, uh, of Homeland Security that have fostered, I think, some really good actions and some really mm-hmm. important, uh, not only public-private partnerships, which I'm sure you're, you're much more aware of than I, than I am, mm-hmm. uh, but also partnerships between federal and state governments to secure yeah. election infrastructure. I think that's gone extremely well. I mm-hmm. think what also has gone extremely well is what we saw as, as as a stark contrast between our ability to defend our election broadly in 2016 versus 2018. By 2018, we, we, we got ahead of the curve. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, that means the Russians are going to come back at us in different ways. And I think what's most important, as you alluded to, is not maybe the attack on the election itself, mm-hmm. but the attack on our confidence in the result, right? Mm-hmm. And what Russia wants to do more than anything is to, is to shake our confidence in who we are as a people and in our democratic principles and institutions and processes. And you know what, Brian? We're our own worst enemies because we're making it easy for them. Our political leaders are making it easy for them. President Trump, but also the opposition, right? Mm-hmm. So when you have President Trump saying, you know, hey, you know, I, you know, I don't know if I'm going to respect the, the, the election. That's terrible. When you have Vice President Biden saying, well, the Joint Chiefs of Staff are going to go in and march around the White House. I mean, what does that say for democracy? I mean, we have to... We ought to tell all of our leaders, please do not be part of the problem. You know, please be part of the solution and help restore confidence in, in our in our in our democracy rather than help undermine it and create an opportunity for Vladimir Putin and others who want to create this crisis of confidence. And so, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm uh, struck by and I tell the story in the book, Brian, and this is something you've probably tracked very closely, mm-hmm. is that after the 2016 election, the internet research agency activity went way up after the election. People don't realize that. They don't talk about that. And 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 the, the Kremlin had a whole, you know, they had a whole information campaign ready to go. Was, I think they were as as surprised as Donald Trump was, frankly, when he won the election. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, so the disinformation campaign, as you know, they actually released it before the before the end of the election. That hey, Hillary Clinton stole the election from Donald Trump. That was their narrative. Well, they had to reel that back in really quick and twist it to, oh, hey, Donald Trump would have won the popular vote if it wasn't for, you know, a rigged election. And then what they did is they started to put their money and their bot and troll traffic behind the resist movement, the not my president movement, you know, and just like they do on other hot button issues like, you know, like gun control or immigration. They support both extremes. Right. And and try to pull us apart from each other. And thanks to social media, you know, uh, present company you know, accepted, <laughs> right. <laughs> is, that, is that, you know, social media is part of the problem, man, a big part of the problem, mm-hmm. especially the algorithms that present material to entice you to click more and more and to get more advertising money. And the way to do that is to show you more and more extreme content that reinforces your existing beliefs mm-hmm. rather than provides you with any kind of one set of facts, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that we can all begin a civil discussion on. So I, I really think, that we are, are our own worst enemies in a number of ways. Our political leadership, I think, is not helping at this stage. And I think social media is, is a big part of the problem. Is this, 
What's the biggest, you know, this comes from an audience question as well. What is the biggest threat to U.S. democracy now? Is it our lack of confidence in our electoral systems? Is it pressure from the Russians? Is it the the geopolitical rise of the of China? Is it you know, the continued threat of, of terrorism? I would say it's education, Brian. You know, I, I, in, in the conclusion of the of Battlegrounds, I, you know, I, I quote my friend, Zach Shore, uh, the, mm-hmm. the historian from, you know, from whom I, I borrowed the term strategic empathy. You know, he's a professor at Berkeley. He's a guy, yeah. guy's a brilliant historian, you know, and just an all around great person. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the greatest strength of a nation is an educated populace. And if yeah. you think about really those who are most vitriolic, in today's discourse are those who know the least about problem sets. This is why the Commonwealth Club, this is why, Mm -hmm. you know, the Commonwealth Club is part of the solution. You know, these sort of organizations that that help us educate each other, that bring us together for civil discussions, Mm -hmm. you know, where where we can explore issues in depth, where we're tolerant of other people's views. I mean, I think these venues are more important now than, than ever. And I think what we really have to take a hard look at, Brian, I mean, is, is, is uh, civics education and yeah. history, how we teach history. It should be possible. It should be possible to have faith and pride, pride. I, I quote Richard Rorty in, in, mm-hmm. uh, in, in the uh, conclusion that, you know, that, that pride is to nations like self-respect is to individuals, mm-hmm. a, a, a necessary condition for self-improvement, right? And so it should be possible to celebrate this great experiment in governance that, that was manifested in our revolution. That was manifested in 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 the in the principles in our Declaration of Independence in our Constitution, but to also recognize the imperfections in, in that great experiment, and that and the fact that it took us almost a hundred years to reconcile the greatest contradiction and, and the greatest bl- blight on our history, which was slavery. Mm-hmm. But then we should celebrate, shouldn't we? Celebrate the emancipation of four million Americans in our most destructive war of history. Yes. Should we also be disappointed though about Jim Crow, the rise of Ku Klux, Klux Klan? You know, the, the de jure, you know, imposition of inequality in, in, in the post-Civil War period and the failure of Reconstruction. Should we also be disappointed? Yes, we should, about separate but equal. But can we also then celebrate the civil rights movement and mm-hmm. the dismantlement of de jure you know, segregation and, and inequality of opportunity, recognizing that de facto it still ha- occurs today and that we have a hell of a lot of work to do in a, in a lot of areas? I think it is possible to do both, right? But now, now I think that there is this, you know, this mentality associated with an interaction of, you know, identity politics and bigotry and racism and, and all of this happening in a toxic you know, information environment mm-hmm. that is pulling us apart from each other. I mean, if you believe one thing, you know, you, you watch one cable news station. If right. you believe another thing, you watch a different cable news station. And so I, I just think all of us have a role, whether it's in academia, whether it's in civil society, whether it's in the Commonwealth Club, whether it's at Facebook. Mm-hmm. We all have to bring people together. And I think we, we ought to come together maybe first and foremost, as I mentioned, around some sort of an agenda for educational reform. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more about this issue of, of education being central to, to our national security future. From my perspective, it's sort of like, you know, when we don't unlock all of the potential of our society, of our fellow citizens, you know, how are we going to compete on the international stage when we're, you know, fighting with one arm tied behind our back, which is what you do when you don't educate a bunch of smart, capable kids to the extent that you ought to. Um, The How do we get there though, right? Because there is right now, there is a, like a visceral, Per, you know, we always think, everybody always says it's the most important election of our lifetimes, right? Like that happens every four years. But we're in the midst of this incredibly visceral electoral process. And you're appealing back to the better angels of our nature, back to our institutions, back to those, yeah. you know, back to good faith implementation of, you know, checks and balances. Um, and how do we get there when, when we've got adversaries pushing on this and we've got, you know, domestic leaders that, that may feel an incentive not to buy into yeah. those, he, those institutions? Yeah. He, you, know, those you, know, you know, Brian, I've got a theory about this. Maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to hear what the Commonwealth Club membership thinks about this, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, think, I think 
I think we're better off than we think we are. Okay. Because I believe that our elites and our media and the, and the, and the environment of social media is more polarized than most actual Americans. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I also believe therefore that we have to be the solution. Right. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I'm all for at this stage, you know, not paying attention to the politicians except to demand better of them. And we should demand better of them. There are some good organizations, as you know, there's that, that one organization that recruits, uh, that recruits veterans to run for office, mm -hmm. uh, but then also makes them pledge to be, to be bipartisan and to, you know, and to introduce, you know, bipartisan legislation in the first term as congressman and woman. I mean, there, there are all these nascent movements now, I think, to, for us to come together. Now, what's terrible is we, we're in the middle of a triple crisis, right? We have the, we have the pandemic. We have the recession associated with the pandemic. We have the, Divisions in our society laid bare by initially George Floyd's murder, and now the mm -hmm. you know Breonna Taylor the, the verdict, and mm -hmm. and and uh, and how the issues have come to the fore of especially inequality of opportunity and unequal treatment under the law and by law enforcement, and and so it's happening at a time where we're not coming together, right? Mm -hmm. And and I make an argument in the book, you know, to, we ought to be coming together, you know, in in clubs and on basketball courts and rugby pitches and mm -hmm. you know in faculty lounges or whatever. Uh, so we need to do that as best we can, you know, uh, you know, on Zoom or, you know, on, on, on you know, social media. But I think we need to have these conversations ourselves. We need to take ownership of it. I think we ought to take a moment to celebrate what we do have going for us. You know, I mean, we do have a say in how we're governed. We really do. I mean, if you live in communist China, you don't. Right. Mm -hmm. So as imperfect as our system is, let's at least, I think, be grateful for what we do have. And then recognize that hey, we we all play a role in, in uh, you know in, in 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 coming up with solutions to to this problem of polarization and the divisiveness in our society, the how worn our social fabric is, and and the concrete problems of maybe you know equal treatment by police uh, or or you know why, why you know how can we any, any longer tolerate that your 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 opportunity in life could be determined based on the zip code you're born in, mm -hmm. uh, based on the on the quality of the education that that you have available to you. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I think we can do it. You know, I'm, I, you know, as you know, I mean, uh, my whole career has been not just to passively accept this, you know, the current conditions, but to try to act on problems and, mm -hmm. and, and, and to, to shift our, 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 you know, our, you know, our situation to, to, to an improved situation or a better place, you know? So I think we can do it. One of the institutions in American society that polls always show is, is one of the most trusted is the military, right? And this is a place where we haven't replicated some of the post-Vietnam uh, divisions or at least antipathy towards the military that, that, that we saw in some circles. Um, what role is there for, you know, general off retired general officers like yourself in these roles? And and, and explain this a little bit within the context of your decision not as a as an officer not to vote in past elections. Yeah. This is a tradition that I wasn't aware of as a civilian before right. I taught at West Point. And and I think uh, I think the audience will be interested in that tradition. And then how do we rely on these folks that do have do, do get a lot of respect from all aspects of American society without undermining? the appropriate yeah. role and distinctions that we have between the civilians and the military. Right. Well, you know, I'm an American historian, so I have to go back to like the time of the revolution, right? I mean, yeah. I think okay. to, you know, George, George Washington's, George Washington's grandparents fled the English civil war. And so it was very much on his mind from the beginning, all during mm -hmm. the revolution and certainly during his presidency that there could no, there had to be a, a bold line between the, the military and any kind of partisan politics. And you compound that, right? You compound that with our founders really, Concern over factions, and that goes back to the English Civil War as well. Federalist mm -hmm. Ten, Madison wrote, wrote all about factions. Alexander Hamilton wrote extensively in the Federalist Papers about factions. Mm -hmm. And one of the lines I think from Hamilton was, "With factions comes violence." Right, and so mm -hmm. so th they feared the partisanship, and they feared the military being drug in into politics in a, in a partisan way. So I, you know, I took the example of George Marshall, right, who never mm -hmm. voted, who was a paragon, I think, of military professionalism. You know, I think everybody should vote. I, I didn't expect that from even my fellow officers in, in our army, but it's a choice that I made to be studiously nonpartisan and, and, mm -hmm. and to and to communicate to really my soldiers and, and the institution, hey, this is what we are about. This is this is an essential part of our military professionalism. 
What I'm concerned about, Brian, is is even like retired officers getting drug into it could taint that that reputation of, of the military. And it became fashionable in recent years like, to get long lists like, hey, here's my list of admirals and generals. Well, like, here's my list of admir- admirals mm-hmm. and generals. And so I refuse to participate in that because I think it's a danger. Now, I don't begrudge them doing it. They do whatever the heck you want when you're retired. But there is a danger associated with it. I'm also, you know, cognizant in the Bay Area here. We are very disconnected as a society, right, from, from those who fight and serve in our name. And so I would just encourage young men and women to join our armed forces. It is tremendously rewarding. The popular popular culture has cheapened and coarsened, I think, mm-hmm. our, our, our understanding of what it means to serve in the military. I would say that our, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines are warriors, but they're also humanitarians. I mean, they, they are engaged against the enemies of all civilized people. And, 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 and they demonstrate tremendous empathy and compassion. Uh, for for those who who are most at risk from these enemies that we're fighting today, uh, and I would also just say that military service is important. I mean, I'm at the center of the Stanford campus here today that doesn't even have an ROTC program. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. how is that possible these days, right? Um, you know, I, I think the benefit of it is that you see young men and women walking around, maybe in uniform, a couple times a week, and some other members of the student body might say, "God, what are those? What are those people doing? Maybe, maybe mm-hmm. I ought to look into that." You know. Um, and, and of course, there's not a military presence in the Bay Area after the Presidio closing, really, or not much of one. Right. And so I think we have to fight to, to keep us connected to the military and then maybe maybe talk to our young people about not just service in our military, but some form of service mm-hmm. that brings us together across all walks of life. And what I love about our military is you see people come into the Army, right? Then they bring mm-hmm. with them. They bring with them all the prejudices, you know, uh, you know, all the all the predispositions that, that they that they come from, however they grew up, right? And then you just watch that you watch it melt away, right? Because you see that the man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives, for you, you know. And when you're in a, when you're in a, an organization like that that takes on the quality of a family, nobody's checking skin color, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. No, nobody's you know checking somebody's religion, nobody's checking their su- sexual orientation, right? You're 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 there. Uh, as part of a family that is bound together by a common purpose, something bigger than yourself, mutual trust, and an ethos of honor and sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And and I think it's a great thing for our Army. Fewer and fewer young Americans can do it in our smaller professional force. Mm-hmm. But I would just ask the members of the Commonwealth Club, please talk to young people about the rewards of service. Because popular culture, I think oftentimes, also looks at veterans as, as traumatized, fragile human beings. I mean, I... I don't know if you saw the speech Vice President Biden um, made recently, you know, about a you know soldier that is veteran that engaged in criminal activity. And I'm just like, oh, I mean, that's that's such a small minority. I mean, mm-hmm. most soldiers emerge. We never want to you know stigmatize combat trauma and all of its all of the uh, you know the negative uh, effects of it. Mm-hmm. But I think I think Americans have a misunderstanding of, of what it means to be a veteran, who our veterans are, and uh, it's un, it's unfortunate. Yeah. What General McChrystal has suggested a sort of year of national service, um, no. you know, a compulsory potentially year of national service. Um, is that an idea that what, what do you think about that idea? Yeah, I think it's, it's a great idea. And actually, you know, I think making it voluntary first is a way to do it. What I found yeah. here at Stanford and I'm sure others members of the club have there's a huge untapped desire to serve among our younger generation. You know, I mean, I guess when you get old, it, is it, it must be tradition, right? To disparage the younger generation. Hey, I'll tell you, I, I've, yeah. I've, I've, met <laughs> I've, met, I've, met, I've met the most extraordinary young people, not, not yeah. in our army, obviously, but mm-hmm. here at Stanford as well. They all want to make a difference. They all want to serve. So I, I you know, I, there was this national commission on, 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 uh, on, on, on service uh, that, that just completed its report. It's a very good report. I recommend it. Mm-hmm. To the club, if if you need help uh, finding it and sending it out to members, I'd be happy to provide the link to it. Uh, but but I think these you know this ought to this ought to be reflected in legislation. It also mm-hmm. ought to be reflected, I think, in on college campuses and high schools and and really you know counselors should be talking to to students mm-hmm. about hey if you want to serve you know here's how you can do it here's how you can make a difference in your community for your country mm-hmm. internationally you know so so. Um, I think I think you're right. I mean, this is a way to bring us together, as well as you know, the initiatives in education. Yeah, 
I, I mean, the re- one of the reasons why I ask this question is 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 I'm, I'm trying to get at this notion that that you've suggested that education is really the heart of the fight in a lot of ways for our for our country, and and we've we've you know, and we have there is, and yet we don't fund it right. We don't we don't invest in these things the yeah. way that we should. We do invest in the military, and you know, you could have endless debates as people do in Washington about what the right funding levels are there, and you know. But but I, you know, there's sort of this this paradox that I'm wrestling with, 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 which is that we should have this focus and this respect and the centrality of the of the military because they do so much good work. And yet I worry that we get to a point where they're the only folks that we we put on that pedestal when there are these other ways to serve. And you're pointing to that in some ways. And I, I don't know how we we square that circle, but it seems to me that that is important to square if we're going to address these larger institutional challenges. Yeah. Well, we have a new respect for nurses and doctors these days, don't we? I mean, yeah, for so sure. I think, you know, how about, how about essential workers, right? Who as we, yeah. many of us, you know, can work from the comfort of our offices, right? They don't, they don't, they don't enjoy yeah. that luxury and, uh, and they're more susceptible to con- contracting a deadly virus, you know, for example. So I, I do think this is an important point that we have to respect all forms of service Two, one of my daughters worked in the government and two of my daughters uh, were, did teach for America. You know, and yeah. and um, and they, they all found it, these experiences to be tremendously rewarding. They did make a difference. Yeah. Uh, and and um, and so, I, you know, I I think holding teachers up on a pedestal, you can't go wrong with that. My mother taught in inner city Philadelphia for 35 years. She made a huge difference you mm-hmm. know, every day there. So, you know, I, I think they're, tr- they're as you're, you're right. Tremendous opportunities to serve and a largely untapped desire to serve among our young people. So that's sounds like an opportunity to me. Yeah. You are now retired, formally. Are you going to vote this time? <laughs> I'm having the discussion with my daughters, I and mean, what a hell of a you know hell of an election to start voting in, right? I mean, right. So, so uh, <laughs> you know, I think I will, Brian. I got, I've got to, I got to think it through. It's a big shift for me, right? This is my right. third. This is really my third career. My first one was at a at a famous restaurant uh, named McDonald's, uh, right. where I was proudly you know employee of the month three years, <laughs> three three months in a row, three months in a row. And then, uh, and then I went to West Point at age seventeen. So you've always been a star student, sir. <laughs> so I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I, I think it's going to be. It, I'm going to consider it a civic duty to do it. Uh, I, I've just stayed so much out of domestic politics now, and man, yeah. I'll tell you, the incentives are pretty low to get involved at this point, right? I mean, in terms of how vitriolic it is, and and and, and how divided we are, you know. Mm-hmm. And, but. Uh, but this feels like the tension, right? I, you know, we're, we're, we're closing at the end of the, the session. This feels like the tension to me in the way in the book, in, in Battlegrounds, is that you said, I don't want to write a political book. And you've walked through our grand strategy. And yet education is the number one threat. I mean, yeah. is there a tension there? No, in the way that so. you when, when, I, when I say political, Brian, I mean partisan political, right? Yeah. And what I lament in the book, whether it's on climate change, which I read about, as you know, not extensively, but but you know, it's a significant part of the book and these interconnected problems of climate and environment and water security and food security and, and health security. You know, we, we, we don't begin conversations ever with what we agree on, right? It's mm-hmm. always about what we disagree on or what the polar extremes believe, right? So, so on climate, you, know, you either get climate deniers or you get Green New Deal. I mean, there has to be something in the middle, right? And so why don't we talk about, hey, climate change is bad, it's real, it's man-made, and we can do a hell of a lot about, about it now. Can we acknowledge that whatever solutions we come up with have to be practical, practical and implementable in developing economies as well, right? Because, you know, as you know, you know, I mean, uh, you know, carbon emissions don't respect national borders, right? And so so I, I think that we can agree on some fundamentals, and there are some tremendously promising uh, tr- technologies, many of which are becoming much more economically feasible. And so, so anyway, I, I, I think... The approach I took in the book is yeah. to not say these, these are these are issues that have to be resolved through a political process, but let's not immediately go to our partisan corners. Let's start with the history of how these challenges develop, for example. So, as you know, every every first chapter in each part of the book begins with how the past produced the present mm-hmm. as the first step in anticipating the future, right? And and so I, I hope the book will be helpful to those who are interested in these challenges and and really, as I say in the, in the end of the conclusion, you know, it will have achieved its purpose if it helps bring us together around these crucial challenges so we can have civil discussions 
uh, and, and develop a, a better and more mutual understanding of how mm-hmm. we can how we can build a better future for generations to come. I mean, that's yeah. it's, it's, it sounds ambitious, but I just want the book to play a small part in that. Yeah. So we've now reached the point in our program where there's, there's time for only one last question. And, and, and the question I'll ask is, in Dereliction of Duty, you were writing a history um, of, of a, a time, and in, including national, the National Security Advisor. In, people are going to begin writing histories of your time as National Security Advisor. How do you hope they understand your time there and your work? Well, I, I hope what they write is that I did my best to try to restore our strategic competence and to put in place shifts in U.S. policy that were in large measure overdue, but fundamentally sound and fundamentally nonpartisan. I think if you go to the December 2017, a highly readable national security strategy of the United States, <laughs> that, that, and if you do, if you, do well a word written, search, yeah. if you do a word search for America first and delete America first, I mean, you can put, you know, you can put whatever label you want on it, right? I mean, I, I think it's, it, is, it, is a, it is a logical argument for what we need to do to protect our vital interests in the area of security, fostering prosperity, and extending influence uh, of our free and open and democratic societies globally. So uh, I hope that's what they'll say. And that I hope that they'll say that I did my best to give the president multiple options to avoid the pitfalls that I wrote about in Dereliction of Duty and to put together a process that best served the elected president and best served the nation. And and maybe in, maybe they'll say, in so doing, I got used up as a result. Right? But I was at peace with that, Brian, as you know. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't there to get another job. You know, I wasn't there to, you know, as a springboard to something else or didn't want to try to keep that job to be in, you know, a so-called influential or powerful position. I just wanted to do my duty. And when I was done, I would be done, you know, and and uh, and I feel as if that our, te- our team did it as best job as we could in, the, in that in that year, uh, accomplished some some very positive things. Uh, some some of w- some of those efforts and policies are, are sustained and, and, and in a generally positive direction. Others have been prematurely abandoned. Um, but I hope that's what they'll say is I gave it my best shot. <laughs> yeah. Our thanks once again to General H.R. McMaster, former National Security Advisor under President Trump, senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, and author of the new book, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. This program has been part of the Commonwealth Club's Good Lit series, sponsored by the Bernard Osher Foundation. We also thank our viewing audience, If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org online. I'm Brian Fishman, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned. Thank you.